So we've had a couple candidates kind of looking forward into the future uh, for America. We also here at New Hampshire Rebellion like looking in the past and we are uh, very honored today to have with us a figure from the past. Day to you all. Thank you. It is a great pleasure to be with you here today. I am here as the spirit of Betsy Ross, as a reminder to you <clears throat> that your American democracy was originally established by the determination, hard work, and collective struggle of my friends and neighbors your colonial ancestors. Many of them died giving birth to that democracy. And that democracy is now your heritage. As we once held it for you in trust, you now hold it in trust for your next generation. I have come this day to warn you of that which some of you may already know. Beware. The process has already begun to slowly and methodically change your dem democratic government into an oligarchy. And your democracy is now in serious peril, being lost to you forever. We are one and the same. <laughs> Have you ever found yourself becoming discouraged as you witness the deterioration of your election process? If so, you are not alone. Do you cringe as you see some of your candidates for public office resort to childish bickering of personalities instead of a thoughtful discussion of the serious issues to promote the common good of your country. Have you perhaps even had the strange feeling that in some ways your election system has become very similar to a puppet show, a very serious and sinister political puppet show, which with the puppeteers being a very small number of extremely wealthy <clears throat> donors holding all the strings. The show, however, is not for your entertainment, but rather for the economic benefit of this tiny group of elite puppeteers. The strings they hold cost millions and millions of dollars. And no one spends millions and millions of dollars without expecting something in return. So what do you think? Who will your legislative puppets in office look to after the election is over? When it is time to legislate, Will they look to you for directions or to their wealthy puppeteer donors who put them in office? Do these puppet legislators even know the will of the people or do they care? And they are too busy courting wealthy puppeteer donors for the next upcoming election. Have you distanced yourself from all this? by allowing apathy to set in. I know many of you here haven't, but many out there have. Do you cringe? As you see some of your candidates for public office resorting to ch 
childish bickering or thoughtful discussions instead of thoughtful discussions to promote the common good. If so, you are not alone. I think I've said this before. You know, when you're old, things do get a bit confused. So <laughs> bear with me. If you're not there yet, you will be at some point. The answer, of course, for all of this should not be apathy, but active citizen involvement. How did all of this, how did it all come to this, you may ask? How did it all begin, and what are we now to do to protect our democratic government from falling into decay? During the last half of the 20th century, many of you were very content with the state of your government and of your growing middle, <clears throat> sorry, middle class economic status, and rightly so. But both were the envy of the world. But, but contentment can often lead to complacency. And democracy cannot thrive long under conditions of complacency. Many of you allowed yourselves to become distracted by life's everyday issues. You assumed that democracy would just continue to exist unchanged and indefinitely without much effort on anyone's part. What many of you didn't know was that a very small number of your wealthy citizens began to put a very serious effort into slowly, stealthily, and secretly changing the laws and the format of your government to benefit their own economic status at the expense of you the growing middle class. Your heritage and your priceless free speech rights as American citizens were being slowly sold off to the highest bidder. Now, in your 21st century, some of you are noticing that in the past few decades, duplicitous election finance laws have slowly and surreptitiously been creeping into your, and corrupting your political and legislative process. To make matters even worse, you be, had begun to see unacceptable Supreme Court interpretations of those laws, such as the Citizens United and the Buckley decisions, amplify that government dysfunction and corruption. In order to stop this corrupting influence, those decisions need to be overturned by the American people through the constitutional amendment process. A large number of you, however, have begun to feel so overwhelmed by the enormity of the dysfunction and corruption you see in your government that you believe that that's, this is just the way it is now, that there is nothing we can do to prevent this dysfunction and corruption. The dysfunction and corruption are, in fact, the eyes that to go to. <clears throat> the dysfunction and corruption are, in fact, inevitable. That your voices just don't count. Beware. If all of you collectively believe this to be true, it will become so. It is, after all, quite possible that it might just be this inertia of your voter apathy that will ultimately claim the, disint the disintegration of your <clears throat> American democracy. But it does not necessarily have to be so. To slow down and reverse the effects of this debacle will require the combined efforts of all of you working together to become more aware of your political surroundings and to exercise your right as constituents to vote with knowledge and with understanding. This work will not be easy and it cannot be done quickly, but it must be done. Many citizens in New Hampshire, in fact, have already begun the daunting task. The New Hampshire Rebellion and Open Democracy 
your hopes here at this We the People convention represent New Hampshire activists who have worked tirelessly on campaign finance reform for a number of years. Getting the state of New Hampshire to become the 17th state to call for a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United was one of its major goals this past year. Research indicates, I understand that's to the media, I'm not sure what that is, I haven't been around that long, but I know you do. Research indicates that 78% of the American population currently polled believe that the Citizens United ruling should be overturned. Many of you already know that the citizens in 69 New Hampshire towns work to get such an amendment. You might also know that the New Hampshire Senate, your Senate, in Concord, supported the majority of the New Hampshire constituents by unanimously passing Senate Bill 136. Ooh. Yes! Ooh. However, there is a however, which recognized the need <clears throat> for this amendment. What you might not know, and what you should know if you don't, is that when the New Hampshire House finally got around to voting on SB 136, 10 months later, the Senate voted unanimously last February. It was only January, last month, that the House got around to voting. However, with the votes, I'm sorry, 10 months later, that bill was passed in the House, much to everyone's surprise. This is the however. When the votes were passed for a recount, those same votes were changed, and the bill failed by a substantial margin. Keep in mind, it had just won. It had gone through the Senate and the House of New Hampshire, and it had passed. The questionable proceedings by which representatives were pressured to change their vote after the vote was originally taken and the sudden and inexplicable breakdown of the electronic voting machine at the House left many constituents questioning the ethics of the New Hampshire House leadership. Many members of the New, New Hampshire, excuse me, of the New Hampshire Rebellion feel that the House leadership is working against the well-being of New Hampshire constituents. Ultimately, Senate Bill 136 failed. Just as your New Hampshire House failed you that day. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and we need to be aware that this happened and we need to tell our neighbors, our family, and our friends, because that's the only word, way the word gets spread is through all of us. This flagrant disregard for the wishes of the constituents is the very reason why we need this constitutional amendment so badly. On a more positive note, I would like to remind you of the incredible work of the late oh, Granny T. Haddock. <clears throat> she was from Dublin, New Hampshire, one of us, a New Hampshire resident. She's the founder of Open Democracy, who is hosting us. Her famous 3,200 mile walk across the country in the years 1999 to 2000, at the age of 90 years, to call attention to the need of campaign finance reform legislation was extraordinary. To this very day, her followers continue to walk in her footsteps as the New Hampshire Rebellion. Yesterday, for example, a number of you walked from this site to the site of the Republican debate at St. Anselm's College. 
<clears throat> to be a visible presence and a witness there. After many years of activist work, and at the age of 100 years, Granny D left us in 2010, before she had a chance to deliver her last written speech. Her words, however, could have been, could easily have meant, been meant for you to hear this day. Your concerns today were her concerns. I want very much for you to hear them and would like to read to you the beginning paragraphs and the last statement of her speech. It is with the utmost respect and honor to her memory that I do so. How prophetic her words are still this day. She begins by thanking her audience, and then she goes on to say, quote, nations, history has shown us, have a state of mental health. A nation may be open and positive, hardworking and fully confident of its future. It may be, it may send great white fleets around the world and humans into space. A nation may also be angry, self-destructive, <clears throat> cruel. We are individuals and we are all parts of the whole. The whole can be as troubled or as ecstatic and positive as an individual. You all know this very well. And you know that at the present time, America is angry and divided, and rather like a mentally disturbed person. Many of its citizens are turning away from obvious truths and embracing angry and dangerous fantasies. Anxiety is driving America's politics today. These are Granny D's words, not mine. Where does it come from? Anger and blindness to the facts are the twin children of powerlessness. Powerlessness over one's own and one's family's future. That anxiety is manipulated by masters of self-interest. In the 1950s, its great corporations began to wash over family businesses on Main Street. The anger of those middle class families should have been directed against those corporations and the political officials in league with them. Instead, anger was purposefully and methodically directed against a phantom communist threat inside of America. Again, excuse me. Against the civil rights of blacks and against the expansion of government into worker protection and consumer protection. Because the anger was misdirected, it was not brought to bear on the proper cause of the anxiety, and so the anger grew. Corporations and the very wealthiest people began to finance the election campaigns of their foot soldiers in Congress. They financed talk radio and propaganda television. Television, I know you know what that is, I'm not sure. <laughs> Thank you. We see, we see millions of people whose anxiety has been hijacked and redirected against their own best interests. In the Reagan years, all the stops were taken off things like hostile corporate takeovers, and the rise of new monopolies. This is me now, monopolies. Remember, they weren't gonna happen. We learned that in school. Well, guess what? Excuse me, I'll go back to Betsy. So that even the most ethical companies were forced to shift their jobs overseas and shutter their, shutter their plants in American towns and cities to avoid hostile takeovers. This was all very profitable for the wealthiest elite. And so the anger grows. 
Guns and ammunition now flow into our communities in semi-trucks. The politics polarizes to the extent that some have no moral or patriotic objections to sabotaging the economy if it will mean more votes in the next election. End quote. At this point, Granny D then continues with spe excuse me, specific suggestions as to what she would do as president to appropriately redirect the anger of the American people. Her last sentence reads as follows. And please keep in mind that these words were written six years ago and the, and the situation has only worsened since then. Quote, frankly, I don't think we have much time to waste. Anger is what is in our way and it comes from the disempowerment of us all." End quote. We're almost there. While a living democracy is a wonderful and powerful form of government, we have seen that it can also become fragile and easily broken if not nurtured with attention and diligence, and diligence of voters, the guardians of democracy. I ask that you look carefully at all the candidates in your presidential primary on Tuesday next. Do not be misled by fear mongers. They have their own hidden agenda which are not in support of the lower and middle class. Think carefully before choosing the one who you believe will work most effectively to represent you and your family by advocating for the common good of all. <laughs> Do the same with candidates for all government offices, federal, state, and local next November. Voting for all these government positions matters very much in order to maintain the balance of power in your democratic government. After the elections have ended, be vigilant. Remind your elected officials, I'm sorry, remind your elected officials of their responsibility to, wrote, to represent both their constituents interests and the common good of all. Commit to yourselves and to each other this very day that we the people will stand again together in order to guard the American democracy. Do this not only in memory of those who died in the past protecting that dem democracy for you but also for the future of your children and your children's children. Thank you. Thank you so much, Betsy Ross.